30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body fat percentage than others. And so there is a bit of a range here. I think we obviously chose, I think, a pretty generic number, but how does someone tell, or how can you tell if someone has too much visceral fat? And like, what, explain yeah. that and 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 because that is what matters even more so than the actual 29 30 percent that type of number and like how that can be unhealthy yeah so visceral body fat is the fat that surrounds the organs it's under the muscle typically um the other kind of body fat would be outside right so let's say you have a belly but it's hard you ever seen someone like this mm -hmm. you know i had like i have relatives like this where they have a big belly but it's really hard yeah in fact, they'll tell you. As you say, it's there's always the that uni uncle. Ab. Everybody yeah. has yeah. that uncle who's like, feel good, feel it. Yeah. Mine's a keg. Yeah. 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 Look how hard yeah. and solid and that, it is. That just typically means that there's lots of body fat underneath the muscle. And, and, and the data on visceral body fat shows that it's far more damaging to the body for your health than the kind of body fat that sits outside of the muscle. Um, now, if somebody has uh, a lots and lots of visceral body fat, not a good idea. Getting leaner will get rid of that as well. But you typically see more visceral body fat as a percentage of someone's body fat when someone has insulin resistance. So you start to see this uh, because there's a there's a ratio of visceral to uh, you know body fat outside of the, the muscle or on top of the muscle that you typically will see. I don't know what that ratio is, but there's a general ratio. It, that ratio starts to become skewed when someone also has metabolic uh, issues where, where they're insulin insensitive. Um, this is where you start to see visceral body fat start to really build. So maintaining a good muscle mass, uh, not having blood sugar issues, not getting diabetes, tends to keep visceral body fat um, at bay, or at least at the percentage that it should be of your overall body fat. Yeah, because there's obviously examples, uh, and we've talked about this before on the show, of like these, you know, high level uh, MMA fighters, uh, and they obviously carry more than, say, 10% yeah. body fat on them. But they're in great cardiovascular yeah. health, and you know have have a relatively good diet, and can, and are strong, have a lot of muscle mass on them. But they may be higher in the body fat percentage. There's an example of somebody who probably has lower visceral fat, and they're healthy, and they don't have any of the side effects that come with the high visceral fat. Yeah, typically, and you know, strength training when they compare forms of exercise for fat loss, strength training seems to have more of an effect on visceral body fat than other forms of exercise. Mm -hmm. So when you compare them head to head and people get lean doing, let's say cardio versus uh, strength training, traditional strength training, traditional strength training seems to be more effective at getting rid of the visceral body fat. But it's probably because the, and, and this is the theory around it, it's probably because of the insulin, insulin sensitizing effects. Mm. One of the fastest way to get your body more sensitive to insulin is to simply build muscle. More muscle is a storage tissue, vessel yeah. for glycogen, right? So glycogen is what you get uh, when you eat carbohydrates or sugar. So when you have high blood sugar, it means you have the circulating sugar in your blood and it needs to go somewhere. It needs to get mm -hmm. stored, the liver or muscle. Well, when you build muscle, you've got a larger storage, storage vessel tank. for storing sugar and, and carbohydrates. Um, and, it, and so they think that this is one of the reasons why strength training seems to be more effective for visceral body fat than other forms uh, of exercise. No. But definitely, definitely like being overall healthy is, is the best way to do this, even if you're lean, because you can see people who appear skinny who have a lot of visceral body fat, but they have really terrible metabolic health. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, taking somebody who is, say, around 30% and wanting to get down to the 10% body fat range, what are some of the top things that sabotage somebody on this journey? Th this is where the real conversation starts, right? Because... Um, I could give you a simple answer, right? We all know the simple answer is people eat too much, too many calories, right? You eat more calories than you burn those calories, that energy needs to get, needs to go somewhere. So it gets stored as body fat, but it's such a simple, simplistic way of looking at things. Obviously, okay, we're eating too much energy, but why does this keep happening? And why is it happening more and more often? And why does it seem person? more difficult for some people than other people? Yeah. Right? Everybody has an example of their friend who they're like, man, we eat the same stuff and they look like this yep. and I look like that. So 
I, I hate when we just default to the, oh, you're eating too much, uh, you're not burning enough. Yeah, it's like, why, why, are, why are people suffering from poverty? Well, they don't make enough and they don't save enough. Like, okay, great. Yeah, like, yeah Einstein. You know, yeah. How, do we, <laughs> yeah. how do we fix this? Well, I think, okay, at the end of the day, what we need to look at, uh, the main thing that we need to deal with, and this gets real complex, but the main thing we need to deal with is, how, why are people eating or behaving in ways that encourage overeating? That's what we need to look at. Like, it, what, what are we encouraging overeating? Are we just not burning enough calories? A lot of people would say we're not burning enough calories. But what's interesting about that is the data shows that our, our metabolic rates adapt to our activity. There's a famous study I've brought up uh, at least, you know, 50 times in the podcast of the Hadza tribe. These are modern hunter gatherers who are way more active than the average Westerner. And when they test their metabolic rates, they burn as many calories roughly as the average Western couch potato. And that's because the body adapts, right? It, your body's not trying to get you to burn tons and tons of calories through movement because we wouldn't have survived evolution if that were the case. So most of the problem is in the fact that we just eat a lot more calories. So again, how do we, what is it about our behaviors? What is it about our lifestyle that's encouraging this overeating? Is it just that we're gluttonous? Or is there something else? Um, and I'll point to the data on um, heavily processed foods. These are the best studies that we have on nutrition. You know, most studies on nutrition, the vast majority are not controlled. Most of them are survey-based. It's like, you know, how many tomatoes did you eat last week or whatever? Mm -hmm. And those are notoriously inaccurate. Um, the very few studies are controlled where they put people in labs, they control what they eat, or they, at least they count what they eat, and then they take measurements from there. The processed food studies are like that. They've taken groups of people, put them in rooms, observed them, and said, okay, let's see how much they eat when they're exposed to all whole natural foods in this group or all heavily processed foods, right? Foods that come in wrappers or boxes um, or, you know, with lots of ingredients type of deal in this room. And then what they did with these, because they were quite smart with this, is they actually made the macro profiles similar. So it wasn't like all carbs or all protein, whatever. It was like similar. It was just whole natural foods versus heavily processed foods. And then they observed. And then they took those same groups and switched rooms, even better. Now it's not like maybe we accidentally got a bunch of people who like to eat a lot in this room or whatever. They said, this switch rooms and see what happens. And consistently, consistently, people will eat on average five to 600 more calories a day by eating heavily processed foods. No. So I think that's got to, that has to play the biggest role because that's a big, that's a big jump. Five to 600 calories a day. That's an extra 3,500 calories a week, which I know that, you know, we're about to do some simple math here that doesn't <clears throat> always break down, but there's roughly 3,500 calories in a pound of fat. So technically a pound of fat, so you, fat a week. You'd put that up as the number one contributor 100%. over. Now, where would you put something like lack of sleep uh, in terms of the downstream effects from that and, you know, hormone balance and, you know, obviously like. Uh, just recovery in general. Yeah, I would say all those play a role. Um, but if you took uh, a bunch of people who are sleep deprived, again, this group eats 85% of their diet, which by the way, okay, the uh, average American diet is between 70 to 80% heavily processed, okay? If you expose them to heavily processed versus not, you would still see the difference. Yeah. So everybody eats more when they're sleep deprived. Yeah. But the well, they especially lean to those like, yeah. overly processed foods when they're sleep deprived. Totally it creates well, those cravings. Sticking with this processed food conversation, which I love because this happens to be one of the more uh, debated topics in our space. Yeah, this isn't like a. Uh, it's in fact, I think it's one of the most difficult things to communicate because we tend to have two camps in the health and fitness space that communicate about processed foods. You have, uh, obviously, some of the people that are on the whole natural, hippie, crunchy, woo-woo side that yeah. would be like, oh, my God, it's the worst thing for you. It's the devil. All, they talk about all the chemicals and the hormones yeah, and everything yeah. that's so bad about these processed foods, mm -hmm. and they're, it's killing us, and it's kind of fear-mongering on that side. And then you have the uh, science-heavy counter-argument in the health space that's going to debate those woo-woo people and be like, oh, everything is a chemical. Yeah. Yes, if you if all yeah. calories are equated for, then all the science points to there is nothing wrong with these processed foods. You can absolutely lose 30% down to 10% down body yeah. fat. And so I, I like that you went this way to have this conversation because I know there's people right now that are listening to this that are on one side or the other. Obviously, you communicating processed foods are your number one. The the woo-woo people right away jump yeah. on board with you. But there is definitely a group of people 
that are listening right now that are resistant to that being you claiming that that's the number one tip when they're listening to their favorite fitness professional that's telling you there's nothing wrong with those uh, protein cookies. There's nothing wrong with you know a bag of chips so long as it fits your macros. Right. And so you you point out at as that being the number one, if not one of your top reasons that sabotages someone from being successful like that. Yeah, 100%. I mean, look, let me ask you guys, when you guys train clients, what was the one step that a client could take that would have the biggest If you had to pick one thing, what was it? Yeah, whole foods. It mm -hmm. was this. Yeah. Now, it's not, are, are processed foods inherently unhealthy? No. I mean, although I can make the argument that mo for the most part, they're not as healthy, quote unquote. I mean, how do you define that, right? But not as healthy as whole natural foods. But forget that for a second. It's just heavily processed foods. Most of the ingredients that are in those foods are in there to make them more desirable to eat. So they're just more, for lack of a better term, addictive, more pleasurable, more hedonistic. And so people eat them more. It's just a fact. Look, remember we had Chris Kresser on the show years ago. I loved the line that he used or the example that he used. He said, imagine if I put uh, four or five plain boiled potatoes in front of you, no salt, no butter, mm -hmm. and I told you to eat them in 30 minutes. Do you think you could? I'm like, oh my God, it'd be hard to choke them down. After the third one, I'd probably gag. And he said, well, could you eat a whole family-sized bag of potato chips? It's right Easily. around the same <laughs> amount. Right, except one of them is engineered to be hyper palatable, and the other one is just what you find uh, in nature. So it really boils down to if if you're trying to lose weight and you find it difficult to eat uh, the right amount of food. In other words, do you find it difficult to not overeat? Yes, avoid foods that make you overeat. What is that? Heavily processed food. There's another layer to that that I think you have to point out too. That a lot of the science fitness people don't point out. They talk about the what the science and the data says about the calories, but then they 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 lack the information or lack the the communication around the behavioral psychology yeah. related to this. And there's something to be said, this is something that I learned with training so many clients is if I told my client they can't or don't, it's just like talking to a toddler. It's yeah. like you tell a toddler, "Don't do that." It's like it's the first thing they go and do versus keeping their mind occupied on something else, right? And distracting them. They don't seem to think or care too much about that. The th same thing would work with clients. Instead of me telling them you can't have these things, I would say, you can have anything you want so long as it's whole food. Eat as much as you want. Yeah, you eat as much as you want. I'm not gonna tell you that you have to weigh, you have to measure, you do stuff. Just these are the foods I want you to choose from. There's something to be said about the power of that psychology yes. that, and that game that you're playing, even with yourself, is saying like, hey, my, my trainer, or I'm not telling myself I can't have these things. All I'm saying is, hey, I'm gonna make it a goal that I just make choices from Look, whole foods. I, I've never had a client struggle with weight loss who just didn't wanna eat a lot of food. That doesn't exist. Somebody who just, you know, yeah, it's not a problem. I can eat less and I can eat the right amount. And in fact, I don't have cravings to do more. They don't struggle with this because they're not struggling with the, the urge or the desire to eat more food. Heavily processed foods are engineered precisely to do, to make you eat more. And it, it, it even includes health foods. Even health foods, quote unquote, health foods, you mentioned protein cookies, right? Or whatever. Mm -hmm. When you look at that category, the top sellers in the, in that category of foods are not the ones that are the healthiest. They're the ones that taste the best yeah. because people enjoy eating things that they enjoy eating. So uh, that's one of the biggest things that sabotages fat loss. So although it is true, you could eat the right amount of calories, it, even though you're eating a predominantly uh, you know heavily processed food diet, you're going to struggle. It's not going to be easy. Why don't we just make this a lot easier? Avoid that category. Eat as much as you want. And then what ends up happening, you end up eating five to 600 calories less a day on average. This is just, this is just again, what the data shows. In my experience, the only client this has ever worked for is the client that is competing. Oh, Ooh. with the processed foods? Yeah. Yes. The client- Because they count everything. Because they have to. Because that's part of this getting into a competition. You have to track, you have to measure, you have to weigh. And so their ability to insert, you know, protein cookie, their diet Cokes, their what all these different things into their diet is totally fine because they're tracking diligently and they have to do that in order to compete at this whatever level yeah. they're competing at. The clients who are just going off of how they feel or trying their best to track or pay attention to 
never succeeded with a strategy like this no. where you allowed them to eat all these processed foods. It was far easier as a trainer to get my clients to reduce this body fat, to drop this body fat percentage from 30 down to 10% by just having them stick to whole foods. Oh yeah, it was one of my uh, my hacks. It was like a magic trick. Um, in fact, clients would always come back to me and say, what is it about heavily processed foods that makes them make you gain weight? Like I, I'm eating a lot right now, but I'm getting leaner. It's like, we're actually eating less calories. You just don't realize it. And then we would yeah. track and sure enough, I'd show them. And along the lines of what we're talking about in terms of eating in ways that, that promote not overeating, we took whole natural foods that's at the top. Underneath that is high protein foods. Mm -hmm. High protein foods or, or high protein in general is very satiety producing. It's one of the fastest ways <clears throat> to get your appetite and cravings to go down is to eat the protein first. Eat a high protein meal, eat it first, you're far less likely to overeat when you do that. So that would be the second thing that I would say is that people, when they tend to eat a meal, they tend to not eat the protein first. They tend, In fact, meals tend to be served this way, yeah. carbohydrates first and then proteins last. Well, eat the protein first. Yeah, I was thinking about you know your original point of whole foods and then versus like processed foods. Like there's a speed issue there in terms of like speed of digestion, speed of delivery, like, you know, just eating chips. You're just constantly yeah. kind of – you know, going through the bag pretty quickly versus it takes a while to get through like these boiled uh, <laughs> potatoes. And plus, it's not like super enjoyable on top of that. But um, it, I think there's just like unconscious eating that's happening as well when you're when you have those types of foods where you're just grabbing and, and you're you're eating. You don't realize how many calories well, you're consuming with, with that. Without going too deep in the weeds, right? Uh, our our bodies evolved with a satiety mechanism to tell us to stop eating. And what combats that is uh, are all the signals that we're getting from the food in terms of its palatability. And it's for, for thousands of years, it's been balanced. But then what we did in, in, you know, not that long ago, it's only been six or seven decades, right? Where we've really started to push uh, heavy, heavily processed foods. And it's really only been a few decades where it's been it become a predominant part of our diets. It doesn't match the satiety. It doesn't match the satiety signal. It's actually offset. So again, five to 600 calories consistently in the data. That's not a little bit. I mean, let me put it this way. If you ate 100 calories extra a day right now, by the end of the year, you'd have significant fat gain, let alone 500 or 600 extra calories. So that simple thing right there, and like I said, for, for my clients on average, if I had a client that had to lose 30 or more pounds, I could consistently get them to lose 15 to 20 pounds with that step. Nothing else. We wouldn't, do, we wouldn't even touch anything else until we got to 15 to 20 pound weight loss. And it was just from that step right there. All right. We're talking about fat loss real quick. Sorry to interrupt, but we have a free fat loss guide, how to lose fat in three easy steps. It's totally free. Click on the link in the description below. Now, this episode is brought to you by a sponsor, Legion. They make high performance supplements for people who are into building muscle, strength, improving athletic performance, and burning body fat. It's one of the best supplement companies around. What they say is in the bottle or on the bag is in the bottle or on the bag. The integrity of this company is bar none. One of the best. Go check them out. Go to buylegion.com. That's B-U-Y-L-E-G-I-O-N.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump. Get 20% off. And if you're a returning customer, you get double rewards points. We also have a sale this month. Maps Bands is half off and Maps 40 Plus also half off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. So no processed foods. We're starting to eat protein, protein first. first. What are some types of protein? Or are there types of proteins that are best for building muscle and getting lean? Yeah. So in this category, in the context of fat loss, whole natural protein versus protein powders. We just talked about heavily processed foods. So, you know, a lot of supplement companies won't like this, but uh, protein powders are heavily processed foods. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, 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 you're taking a powder that tastes like chocolate or strawberry or birthday <laughs> cake or whatever. It's pretty damn processed. Um, it doesn't affect satiety like whole natural protein does. In fact, protein shakes are great for weight gain. Yeah. They're convenient. They're sure. convenient and they're really good for, for people who have a tough time gaining weight. In fact, this is the advice I give people when they're like, yeah. I can't eat enough calories. I want to put on size. Try a shake because it doesn't crush your appetite like eating a piece of chicken or, or something like that. So I would say any whole natural source of protein is going to be great. Uh, and, and the ones that are a higher percentage of protein per weight are probably best when it comes to appetite. So leaner sources of protein are going to crush your satiety more 
than fattier sources uh, and more than, let's say, sources that maybe vegan sources that come with lots of fiber and, and carbohydrates. Yeah, I would say things like that, right? You got your, like your, all your white meats, your fishes, yeah. meats like that are going to be high in protein, Flanks, leaner, lower in steak. calories, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. Probably better, at, especially early on when we were at this phase of reducing our body fat from 30 down to 10. Uh, probably less of the tri-tip, the ribeye. Yeah. Even though things like that are okay, it's not that they're demonizing or it's bad. But if bad. you had to pick, but if you had to pick, you're yeah. you're gonna you're gonna get a lot more bang for your buck from a satiety, from a high protein and a low calorie by doing things like white meat, fishes, ground turkey, yeah. things like that are probably chicken better. thighs are great. By the way, chicken, I, yeah, yeah. You mentioned white meat. People think chicken breast right away. Yeah, chicken thighs are perfectly fine. Yes, they're, they're not that much higher in calories. Oh, and they taste a million times better. way better. Chicken so much is terrible. So much easier to reheat and consistently hit. Uh, chicken thighs than it is chicken breast. It was like probably one of the first hacks I ever taught any of my clients is like, stop wasting your time uh, microwaving on day two, day three chicken breasts yeah. that are dry and chewy. At least enjoy the good fat that's in chicken thighs and it's not that many more calories now, for the protein. Speaking of the fattier cuts, you know, grass-fed uh, meat is leaner per ounce than the traditional, you know, grain-fed. So, now, without getting into like which one's healthier, fatty acid profile, you know, which one's better for the environment, animals, all that stuff. Forget that for a second. An eight ounce ribeye that's grass fed is less calories than an eight ounce ribeye that's grain fed because it's got less fat in it. So that's another strategy is you could take your red meat and just make it grass fed and eat the same amount, your calories drop. I also want to point out before the keyboard warriors get on here and start attacking you for you know criticizing protein shakes, uh, the point of the conversation is not that uh, we're trying to demonize that as right. like uh, you can't use it. I mean, I'm we're sure- We're talking about going down from 30 to 10%. That's right. And it's also, st and strategies that we would want to give clients to set them up for success. It doesn't mean that anybody in this room, in fact, I bet everybody in this room in the last week has probably used a protein shake, right? right? So it's not that, and so we, we have, we do advocate or we do talk about the use of them and they can be very useful in a pinch, in a bind. But as a strategy, when I'm taking a client who comes to me with 30% body fat and they're telling me what are the best steps for me to get down to 10% body fat, and I'm thinking about all the common mistakes that people make, this is one of them is right away, for some reason, people think when they go on a diet, oh, I got to add the shakes and bars, like it's a healthy choice for them to make. And in fact, they don't realize that they may actually be making it more difficult for themselves because instead of going and getting a piece of steak or chicken or whole food, that's going to produce more satiety, get more nutrients, right. micronutrients with it, they are going over to these shakes and bars and then they're hungry again another That's hour right. to it and it's difficult to do that. So it's not that we're demonizing it or saying they can't have value or we wouldn't use it. It's that when I'm thinking of this client, this avatar who's going from 30 down to 10%, I'm thinking of the most important strategies to teach them. And then down the road, we could talk about like, oh, okay, you're short on protein. It's late at night. Having a shake real quick before you go to bed. Great strategy. Great way to make sure you hit your protein. No, intake. very good point. Like at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is make this as easy as possible because going from 30% to 10% body fat is a long road and it's going to be a bit challenging no matter what. Okay. I'm going to tell you right now, follow all of our advice. It's still going to be challenging. It's just going to be way less challenging than if you don't listen to what we're saying, you're going to make it almost impossible. In fact, the data shows 85 to 90% of people who lose weight, gain it back. And it's because they don't follow some of the things that we're talking about. All right. So let's talk about the strategies. Okay. What are some more specific strategies on how to do this. Number one, you got to strength train. But strength train to build muscle. Yes. yes. Not burn calories. No, no, real strength training, traditional strength training. Like you do a set, yeah. you rest for two minutes, you do a set, you rest not for two minutes. Not a circuit. Not circuit training, not where you're just trying to move, but you're literally trying to get stronger and build muscle. Now, why? Because you're trying to burn body fat and not lose muscle. When you cut your calories, inevitably your body will, burn, will, will, will pare muscle down to slow your metabolism out to meet the new caloric intake. Strength training sends an opposite signal. It says, no, we need this muscle. In fact, if you do it right, you may build muscle in the process, which by the way, comes with a wonderful side effect of a faster metabolism. So now you could, you have a faster metabolism, which means you can eat more and still eat less than you're burning and burn body fat. In other words, if you could take your body from burning 2000 calories a day to burning 2,500 calories a day on its own, not because you're moving more, not because you're doing more stuff, but rather you just have more muscle on your body. So it costs more calories to maintain. How much easier would it be to get leaner? Strength training is the best form of exercise, not for weight loss, 
for fat loss. No other form of Sustainable exercise. Sustainable fat loss. No other form of exercise shows pure fat loss uh, like strength training does. And again, the data supports us now. It's not body. It's not just bodybuilders now. It's like you want to lose weight, you got to lift weight. Now, there's two very, very important tips though that I think that that go with this. One, the point you made already about not doing it in a circuit style, giving you actual rest periods, lifting with the intent to try and get stronger. Yes. Right. I want to lift weights with the intent to try and get stronger. That's obviously the first thing. The second thing that's so important is you got to hit your protein intake. Yes. Because one of the most common mistakes that I would get from someone who's trying to go from 30 down to 10% body fat is they go right into cutting calories. And what comes with them cutting hard calories is also reducing their total intake. And many times they were already eating low protein and now they're hitting even lower protein, yet they're lifting weights, sending a signal to the body, hey, we need to build muscle. But then the body goes and looks for its building blocks to build that muscle and you ain't giving it. Yeah. You ain't giving it enough protein. You're not giving it enough protein to then take those nutrients to go build muscle then go speed up your metabolism so you going out and just strength training is step one but if you're not pairing that with the adequate amount of protein every single day consistently then your body's not going to build muscle it's not going to speed the metabolism up. no no you got to give it the building blocks that's why we said earlier whole natural foods and then eat protein first so someone might be wondering well how much is enough protein for this you want to eat your target body weight in uh, grams of protein so if you want to weigh 150 pounds or 130 pounds or 180 pounds, then aim for 180 grams of protein a day. And the best way to do this is to eat that protein first and have it from whole natural source. By the way, I'm going to say this right now. If you eat your target body weight in grams of protein, you eat it first and you stick to whole natural foods, the odds that you're going to be eating uh, enough to lose body fat or the odds that you'll be eating in a calorie deficit, to put differently, are high. They're actually quite high. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, you will not be eating too much by doing this. It may feel like that. And I'm saying that because mm -hmm. protein crushes appetite. A lot of times people, when they do this, are like, oh my God, I'm at the end of the day. Yeah. I need to eat 150 grams of protein. I'm already, I'm at 120 and I can't eat another 30 grams of protein. And 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 why should I? I feel like I'm eating too much now. No, no, no. Hit it and, and, and watch Well, especially happens. the first thing in the day, then you realize like how your blood sugar is pretty stable throughout the day. Good you don't point. get these big swings up and down and which create cravings and create all these other, you know, hunger signals. So it's actually like, if you do that first thing, you notice the, the whole rest of your day is set up. What a good success. point. They actually showed that in studies when people eat a high protein breakfast and high protein would be like a good 30, 40, 50 grams of protein for breakfast. They're less likely to overeat throughout the entire day. Probably because of what you said, Justin. You also highlighted, this is a perfect example of where I would actually introduce a shake to somebody is somebody who, who says that exact same thing back to me. They know that their target protein they need to take every single day is 150 grams. That's what we've decided based off of their body weight or their body weight goal. Okay, we need to hit 150 a day. They're coming to me, Adam. I'm so full at the end of the day. It's seven o'clock at night. Yeah, now I'm shaking. And I'm, I'm only at 110 or 120 grams of protein, and I don't, I don't want to eat anymore. That's but should I just? And since I want to lose weight, shouldn't I just not eat? And I would say no, not in this case. We're strength training to build muscle to speed up the metabolism. You are missing your protein intake consistently. Here's a situation where I want you to get that protein shake in. So we definitely feed that muscle, and it is definitely not going to keep you from leaning out. It's going to go to building muscle, and that in turn is going to speed the metabolism up, which ultimately will help you lean out and get down to the ten percent. Awesome. And now uh, with strength training, we'll go back to that. Right. Uh, one of the the fundamental rules of strength training is known as progressive overload, meaning if you, and this is very true, especially in the first few years of training, later on it gets more complicated, but in those first few years, your body continues to progress because you're progressively overloading it. You're doing more or lifting more than you were previously, so you continue to progress. In other words, when you strength train, it's a stress on the body, and the way that the body uh, adapts to that stress is by becoming strong enough so that that stress is no longer stress. And then what do you do? You add more stress. That's the progressive overload. One of the best ways to do that or to do that consistently is to track your training volume. What does that formula look like? Well, it's sets times reps times weight that you lifted. So if you did three sets of 10 reps of bench press at 100 pounds, it would be three times 10 times 100. That's your volume for that exercise. And then slowly over time, while you're going from 30 to 10%, See if you can either keep that volume the same, as, as, so long as it's appropriate. If you're overtraining, back off. But if it's appropriate, s keep it the same and or slowly inch it up when the time feels right. When you feel strong, you feel healthy, slowly inch it up. And that's how you progressively overload your body 
throughout this process. I even mm -hmm. used to give the advice of just maintain, or I used to say, hold the line, hold the line and hit at least your volume every week and then allow your body to tell you when it's ready for more. Meaning you're going to have these workouts and everybody has experienced this before where you feel good. You just, yeah. you feel rested. You feel well fed. You do that first warm up set yeah. and you're like, wow, the bar is moving really easy. easy. Like here's the time where I'm going to go ahead and stretch my capacity a little bit, go ahead and add a little bit of volume, just a little bit more than what you were doing previously. And then again, we're gonna go back to that, hold the line. Now we're gonna stay there again yep. until I have another one of those days where I'm feeling good. And then I'm gonna add more. And you just do it incrementally like that over time. And you'd be so surprised on how much that starts to compound yep. over weeks and now weeks. Now you combine that with high protein and then you combine it with this next point, which is feed muscle gains. In other words, if your calories are too low, you'll suffer in the gym. Now they need to be low for you to lose weight, but if they're too low, you're going to go to the gym, you're going to feel like garbage. So in other words, one of your number one goals here with this is I need to also kind of get stronger. If I'm getting stronger and I'm sticking to whole natural foods and I'm hitting my protein, I'm on the right track. And what'll probably happen, especially initially, is you'll get leaner while building a little bit of muscle. The scale might not even move that much initially. But what's happening is you're boosting your metabolism. Over time, your metabolism starts to speed up. Now your calories that you're currently eating become more of a deficit and more fat starts to come uh, off your body. Eventually, eventually you get to the point where you start to track and cut your calories. Now, why am I saying that? When you go from 30 to 18, 16, 17% body fat, it's, it's pretty consistent. It's not nearly as hard as going from 16 to 10. When you get down to 10, when you start to get down to the 10, where you, where you want to see your abs, you want to see that six pack, now you need to get a little bit more granular. Now you need to start tracking and then cut from there. But most people, most people in my experience could get into the high to mid teens just by leading, kind of, you know, living kind of a healthy lifestyle with some of those steps. I want, that's yeah. been my experience coaching people is simply by following all the other strategies, we never really had to aggressively cut until you try to get down to like single digits. Right. Mm -hmm. When you start getting down to single digits, and by the way, too, you didn't hear us mention anything about cardio. No. No cardio. You don't even need to do that to get down to that 10%. You can go from 30 all the way down to 10. And in fact, I'm advising my clients to not do cardio, especially until we get to that point. And we want to get down to single digits, nine, eight, seven, six, getting really, really low body fat percentage. Then maybe we start talking about cutting for longer periods of time. We start talking about doing things where we're getting on cardio. Because you know why? Because we're now we're entering into a unhealthy place to be, and I don't want you to be there for very long. But if you're trying to get there just to prove a point, I can get down to six right. or 7% body fat. Then it makes sense to introduce some of these extreme things. But the average person, person who's going from 30% to body fat down to seeing their abs can absolutely do that through all the tips that we talked about and never touch a piece now, of cardio now, equipment. I want to clarify, right? This doesn't mean don't be active every day. You want to be healthy and you want to be active every day. I like tracking steps. Mm -hmm. I like making sure you're getting, you know, a nice 10,000, 12,000 steps a day, which is a lot more than most people will get. So make sure you're moving throughout the day. But what Adam's talking about is structured cardio workouts. Now, why are we saying, eh, I'd rather you not do it? Well, number one, cardio doesn't build muscle. Yes, it does burn calories, but your body adapts to that very quickly. But also, but ultimately, it's like, look, if you're going to spend time in the gym, you're much better off spending it strength training. And most people are not going to work out consistently from the journey of 30 to, to 10, more than three days a week on average. Yeah. So it, I would rather you spend that strength training, not doing 45 minutes the for an hour The focus has cardio. to be on muscle, preserving it yes. at all costs. And I think that's like, that's the biggest misconception with, you know, trying to, to lower your body fat in general. It's like to do that, we need to replace it or preserve the muscle mass that you have. And so it's really, it's every like um, step that you take has to be towards what it takes to build muscle. And that's like the focus of it. And we just, you know, manipulate the nutrition. So it, it provides just enough uh, for the preservation, but also now to cut down so we can start carving into that excess uh, energy store. Well, and piggyback off the steps, one of our favorite ways, I've heard us all communicate this before, is to add steps uh, post-meal. Yeah. So one of the best, because just walking 10 to 20 minutes post-meal uh, is a great way. One, you're pairing it with another behavior, right? All the research supports that if you wanted, you want something to be consistent, one of the fastest, best ways to do that is to pair it with already another habit. You have to eat every single day. You've already, everyone's already made a habit around yep. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So easy. All, now I'm going to start to, you know, set a goal of I'm going to walk for 10 minutes and start small. If you've never done it before and you can't commit to 20 minutes of a walk after a meal and that's not feasible for you, start with five. 
then go to 10, then go to 20. But that's what I would like to get up to is where you're doing for a 15 to 20 minute walk afterwards. Not only are you getting the benefits of the, the activity, the movement, the blood flow, the digestion, you're going with that, you're burning more calories. You're not sending a loud signal that's catabolic, like doing cardio. You're just creating more movement that's overall healthy for you. And it's something that's sustainable so that once you do get down to this 10%, it's a habit that's not hard for you to keep going, which is always important when I'm communicating a goal like this to somebody. It's like, yes, I know you want to go from 30 down to 10% body fat and see your abs, but I bet you want to continue to keep that and see that, right? You don't want to just get there and then go all the way right back to the 30%. So I have to, my goal is to keep in mind that whatever we build into this routine, everything from eating, habits around exercise and movement, it needs to be something that you can st sustain for the rest of your life. Otherwise, you're just going to push your body so hard and you're going to discipline yourself to do all these things. You're going to get there and you have a habit for a moment in time and then you go right back to that old way. 100%. 